I will call the remote hearing of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today is March 2nd, 2021. This meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Hansen is present. Uh, Waslawick, Amy. Waslawick, Amy. Heintzeman, Josh. Heintzeman, Josh. Acom, Patty. Present. Acom, present. Ackland, Susan. Ackland, present. Ackland, present. Backer, Jeff. Uh, Backer, present. Backer, present. Becker, Finn, Jamie. Uh, Eklund, Rob. Present. Fisher, Peter. Fisher, present. Fisher, present. Green, Steve. Present. I go, Spencer. Present. Jordan, Sydney. Present. Healer, Heather. Present. Lee, Fu. Lee, present. Lippert, Todd. Lippert, present. Lewick, Dale. Lewick, present. Morrison, Kelly. Morrison, present. Uh, Nelson, Nathan. Present. Tice, Tama. Tice, Tama. Uh, we'll just go back. Waslowick, Amy. Waslowick, present. And Heintzum and Josh. All right, quorum is present. The quorum is present. The next item on the agenda are the minutes for Friday, February 26, 2021. Um, Representative Lippert, have you looked at the minutes? I move the approval of the minutes, Mr. Chair. Representative Lippert moves the minutes for February 26, 2021. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, the minutes are approved. And Mr. Copel, the minutes are now published on the, on the uh, uh, committee website, is that correct? Uh, yes, they are. Thank you. Uh, our first bill up members, it's House File 75, uh, Vehicles and Property Subject to Forfeit Limited. I will move that House File 75 be recommended to be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Representative Moeller, uh, do you have, also have a author's amendment? That's uh, correct, uh, Mr. Chair. It's the A6 amendment. It's a technical amendment, just putting some clarifying language into the bill. Thank you. I will move the A6 amendment, uh, and I think you just described it, uh, that it's technical in nature. I will move the A6 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like. All, are there any discussion? Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Representative Moeller, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. So this bill reforms Minnesota's asset forfeiture laws. There have been concerns about Minnesota's civil asset forfeiture practices for years, especially in the areas of DWI and controlled substance cases. And this bill is uh, the result of a lot of hard work from a lot of stakeholders, has broad bipartisan support and a number of different coalitions coming together who often have very different views. The motivation for supporting forfeiture reform is varied. For example, there are concerns about how difficult it is for someone to challenge forfeiture and how it disproportionately impacts people of color. There are concerns about due process to the person whose assets were forfeited and concerns expressed about how the proceeds of forfeiture are utilized. In your packets, you have a letter that reflects the various stakeholders who have worked hard to achieve this compromise language. This bill is before your committee, Mr. Chair, because the DNR does do forfeitures. Um, please note that the fiscal note has been re revised to reflect that this bill does not increase costs to the DNR. While the agency must report more details about the items it currently forfeits, the bill does not require the DNR to expand the universe of items it reports on as there are no changes in this bill to chapter 97A. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn this over to my testifiers, and I believe um, Auditor Blaha is the first one up. 
Senator Blaha, uh, welcome to the committee and uh, state your name and who you're with for the record. Oh, thank you, Chair Hansen and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I'm State Auditor Julie Blaha, and with me today are two of our OSA researchers, John Jernberg and Christy John. Um, as you know, uh, the work of the State Auditor is to oversee almost $40 billion in local government spending. Now we do that with examinations, with support and analysis. And today our analysis work comes into play. We do a forfeiture report annually. And so I'm gonna be pulling some key data from our 2019 report that may help you with your decision. If you'd like to see the whole report, and I know that a lot of the people on this committee are just the people who like this stuff. Uh, if you go to osa.state.mn.us, you pull down reports, you'll be able to find all of our forfeiture reports. So I'm going to skip right to, I think, the most important numbers uh, that, uh, that we were talking about today, um, because based on our data, this bill really starts the right conversation, particularly around small forfeitures. We found that in 2019, the net value of all forfeitures in the $1,500 or less category was about $1.5 million. Now, the average size of that individual forfeiture in that category uh, uh, was $473. Now, those uh, that accounted for 75% of the forfeitures that resulted in proceeds that we monitored. Now, furthermore, this, these numbers are pretty typical of what we've seen in the past five years. So what you see, I think, in these numbers is that proceeds from small forfeitures are at best a minor and unpredictable part of any public safety department's revenue stream. Uh, total government spending on police and sheriff services in 2019 was just over $1.7 billion. That means these small forfeitures accounted for only about four uh, tenths of a percent of those budgets. So changes in such a small fraction of a budget are definitely manageable. In fact, you could certainly offset it at the state level, but that's a conversation for another committee, I think. Um, but uh, as you can see though, while it has a, a very small um, system impact, it does have a very large impact on an individual, $473 can mean the difference between, you know, keeping your uh, your your apartment or not, uh, losing your car could be the difference keeping your job or not. So these small forfeitures have a big impact at that individual level. Uh, based on that, we do appreciate the restrictions including the bill. But one caveat: uh, the most common uh, criminal activities leading to seizure, forfeiture, and final disposition of property in 2019, those were DUI related and controlled substance related. So that those accounted for 94% of all forfeitures. I know there are some changes again in the in the bill um, to what would, what would qualify here, but we do need to temper our expectations on the overall impact of these restrictions. Um, I also uh, would like uh, to say that we appreciate the oversight uh, uh, functions in this bill. Uh, anytime you uh, include oversight right from the beginning, it works best. And so we were glad to see the reporting updates uh, included. So again, uh, thank you. We believe this is the right conversation and we appreciate how you're using the data to improve forfeitures in Minnesota. Uh, and we'll definitely be available throughout uh, this section of the hearing uh, for any questions. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Representative Moeller to your next testifier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's Bob Small with the County Attorneys Association. Mr. Small, welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Robert Small, and I am the executive director of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. Um, as Representative Moeller indicated, uh, we uh, at the County Attorneys Association and other law enforcement agencies met with this very these very groups that uh, you'll see that you have a letter from all of those and engaged in extensive uh, negotiations and discussions, the result of which is the bill that you have uh, before you. So I wanted to thank uh, Representative Moeller for bringing this forward and all the other groups that worked with us uh, so hard to get to this compromise. That's all I have, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'd be happy to answer any questions as we go through. We will uh, take questions uh, at the end for all the testifiers. So um, th thank you, Mr. Small. Uh, Representative Moeller to your next testifier. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. The final testifier I have, um, and there are some others who are on standby for questions, but the final testifier um, that we have today is Julia Decker with the ACLU. Mr. Chair. Ms. Decker, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Good afternoon. My name is Julia Decker. I'm the policy director for the ACLU of Minnesota. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as Mr. Small indicated, we are also very grateful to all the stakeholders for all the hard work on this bill. Um, as he indicated, law enforcement, prosecutors, as well as advocates, including ourselves, Justice Action Network, Americans for Prosperity, Legal Aid, Public Defenders, Criminal Defense Lawyers, all came to the table on this issue and worked very hard over the course of many months to reach the compromise language that you have before you. Uh, we're also very grateful to Representative Mueller for carrying this bill. As uh, Representative Mueller and Auditor Blaha indicated, this bill makes a number of changes to the forfeiture system in Minnesota that will provide more protections for innocent owners and for folks with the fewest resources to even engage with the forfeiture system in the first instance. The bill also promotes transparency and accountability with additional reporting requirements. Uh, as you heard, uh, through law enforcement reporting to the state auditor, we currently get a variety of information, uh, including how much police and prosecutors directly receive in forfeiture proceeds. However, we don't currently get information about how law enforcement spends those proceeds. This bill fills in that gap by requiring reporting of how proceeds from forfeitures are spent. And advocates worked with MCAA, the League of Minnesota Cities, and the Sheriff's Association to identify reporting categories that make it easy for local agencies to report expenditures and for the state auditor to provide this additional information in the annual report. This will provide more transparency to the public, to the legislature, and presumably, hopefully, confirmation that funds are being used appropriately. So the ACLU of Minnesota supports this compromise bill as a needed reform to asset forfeiture that, among other things, shines additional sunlight on forfeiture proceeds. Thank you. Thank you, members. Are there any um, other? Are there any questions or discussion on the bill? Any discussion? I don't see any hands up. So, Representative Moeller, any closing arguments or remarks? Not necessarily arguments, but remarks. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'm used to court and making a closing <laughs> argument. Um, no, I don't really have anything other than to just um, thank all the testifiers again and all the hard work that went into this compromise bill. And thanks to your committee for giving us the opportunity to present it today. Thank you. I will renew my motion that House File 75 as amended be recommended to be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Hanson Rick. Hanson Rick, aye. Hanson, aye. Waslowick, Amy. Waslowick, aye. Waslowick, aye. Heinzeman, Josh. Heinzeman, Josh. Heinzeman, aye. Heinzeman, aye. Um, Akum and Patty. Akum, aye. Akum, aye. Ackland, Susan. Ackland, aye. Ackland, aye. Becker, Jeff. Becker, aye. Becker, aye. Uh, Becker, Finn, Jamie. Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Eklund Rob. Aye. Eklund, aye. Fisher Peter. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Green Steve. Aye. Green, aye. I go Spencer. I go aye. I go aye. Jordan Sydney. Jordan, aye. Jordan, aye. Keeler Heather. Keeler, aye. Keeler, aye. Lee Fu. Lee, aye. Lee, aye. Lippert Todd. Lippert, aye. Lewick Dale. Lewick, aye. Lewick, aye. Morrison Kelly. Morrison, I. Morrison, I. Nelson, Nathan. Nelson, I. Nelson, I. Tice, Tama. Tice, Tama. All right, that is 18 eyes. Tice, I. Oh, sorry. I don't know why it didn't work. Tice, I. 19 eyes, zero names. Bill is passed. Uh, congratulations, Representative Moeller. Uh, it's on its way to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, next up, we have House File 1210, Jordan, Insecticide Use in Wildlife Management Areas Prohibited. Representative Jordan, will you move that House File 1210 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill? So moved, Mr. Chair. And Representative Jordan, I believe you have an author's amendment. Could you briefly describe the author's amendment? 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this expands the scope of the bill um, beyond wildlife management areas to include state parks, forests, aquatic management areas, um, and scientific and natural areas, and, in, and expands the insecticides being banned from those areas beyond neonics to also contain for power bus. Uh, Representative Jordan moves the DE1 amendment to get the bill in the form the author would like. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All, all those opposed? Ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Representative Jordan, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and fellow members of the committee. I'm glad to have the opportunity to present House File 1210 as amended which would ban the use of pesticides if they are neonicotinoids or contain chlorpyrifos on categories of public lands managed by the DNR, specifically our Minnesota state parks, state forests, wildlife management areas or WMAs, scientific and natural areas and aquatic management areas. Chlorpyrifos is a neurotoxic chemical that has been linked to adverse health effects in children, including lower birth weight, reduced IQ, memory loss, attention disorders and delayed motor development, other mammals, fish, amphibians, birds, reptiles, and pollinators are also impacted by pesticides containing this chemical, according to the EPA, which has taken steps to ban chlorpyrifos for household use. We have discussed neonicotinoids or neonics and their harmful effects on pollinators and other beneficial insects at length in this committee. And new evidence suggests the impacts of neonics extend beyond our bees and butterflies and impact birds and even our white-tailed deer here in Minnesota. That's why I'm so grateful we have the space to discuss keeping our public land, which belongs to every Minnesotan, and is set aside for the benefit of humans, animals, insects, and plants, free from these toxins and insecticides. These public lands contain some of our most precious and sensitive lands where we as Minnesotans can recreate, hunt, fish, gather, and spend time with our families in our great outdoors. We've got some experts here today to talk about why we should consider this bill as amended, and there's also written testimony in members' packets that I ask all of you to read and consider. With that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to proceed with testimony. Thank you, Representative Jordan. And is your first testifier, Mr. McSwain? Yes. Mr. McSwain, uh, would you uh, state your name and who you're with for the record? Yes, um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Dan McSwain. I'm a natural resource coordinator uh, with Washington County Parks. Uh, for those not familiar with Washington County, it is at um, the St. Croix River is on the east side of our border and Mississippi River on the south. Um, in my role as a natural resource coordinator, uh, I oversee natural resource uh, projects uh, throughout the park system. And one of the natural resources that we uh, look to protect in our parks, which is all publicly open, um, is crop um, cropland. And back in 2016, our Washington County Board uh, passed a pollinator-friendly resolution uh, asking us uh, three things, and two of which, one being restore cropland to prairie and oak savanna throughout the park system, setting a measurable target at 150 acres in five years, uh, and then also evaluating all pollinator-friendly best practices we could implement in parks. And so one of the things that a lot of people don't know, don't know is as we continue to grow our park system, uh, we acquire farmland as we go. And currently right now we're at about 284 acres worth of cropland throughout the entire park system. And as um, you know, each year we'll take out 30 or 40 acres uh, based on that. And um, one of the things that we implemented was a neonicotinoid ban or prohibition uh, within the parks. And I just wanted to talk about the experiences we had when it came to implementing, which I think can relate to what this bill uh, talks about. So uh, one being um, soybeans are very, easy for farmers to adapt and, and go without a neonicotinoid seed treated coating. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, based on some of the University of Minnesota research out there, there's not really a yield uh, revenue impact. And we never saw that within our bid results. And uh, just to tie that in with the 284 acres and the bid revenue, that was one of our big concerns because that revenue is tied to the trees we plant in the park, the native seed, uh, the goats that come in. So we were a little concerned about that and that ended up not being the case. Um, you know, it's been five years now. So we've had a, that neonic prohibition for five years. Um, it's gone well. And I guess the only challenge uh, with any new farmer that comes on board is just talking through and just making sure, hey, can you make sure you go to a different, you talk to your seed dealers and get a neonic, um, a non-neonic 
treated corn seed, which a lot of corn in Minnesota is treated right now. And so that's probably been the only challenge as far as, hey, make sure that the expectation is clear. Um, and it's been happening. And um, for our process, we usually have an annual bid that we put out. And actually this year we transferred it to a five-year bid. And for this up next five years, we'll continue to have a neonic free um, treated seed in our cropland in the parks. So with that, um, thank you uh, for all your work on this committee and for the bill that's in front of you today. Thank you. Uh, we'll hold questions to the end of the testimony. Uh, Representative Jordan, uh, is Ms. Cox next? Yes, Mr. Chair. Ms. Cox, owner and operator, Roots uh, Heritage Farm. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Lori Cox, owner operator of Roots Return Heritage Farm in Carver, and I'm here today in support of House File 1210. Our small farmers produce perennial fruits, annual vegetables, and herbs, and this season we're leasing our farm to four newer producers expanding their markets. We're located within 1,300 feet of U.S. Fish and Wildlife and DNR lands that make up part of the Minnesota River Valley National Wildlife Refuge, which spans 14,000 acres and 70 miles along the river. Wildlife diversity is high priority due to natural services pollinators provide our crops. 15 minutes away is Seminary Fen Natural Scientific Area. With peat ground estimated at 8,000 years old, it's one of Minnesota's most sensitive areas. Areas like these exist all across Minnesota. Just like a rancher might rely on public lands to mow ditches or easements for extra grass, we rely on public lands for pollinator services. Rural, suburban, and urban area producers rely on domesticated and wild pollinators. These are bees, butterflies, moths, flies, wasps, and beetles. They provide customers, income, nutrition, jobs, and food variety. Pollinators are specialists due to size or habit. Raspberries, strawberries, apples, plums, currants, cherries, squash, melons, pumpkins, beans, cucumbers, tomatoes, and more are from this farm and are responsible for 87% of flowering plants worldwide. Numerous published studies have proven damaging effects of neonic insecticides. A 2019 study, including U of M B Labs' Dr. Marla Spivak, showed 121 different herbicides, fungicides, insecticides discovered in wax, pollen, bee bread, and bees. In wax samples, clopyrifos was in the top four insecticides found 63% of the time. And pollen, a top three insecticide, was found 43% of the time. Its EPA modes of action are identified as nerve action. Yesterday, the DNR published neonics were found in 61% of white-tailed deer spleens. Reliance on natural systems on natural land is in all Minnesotans' best interests. Facts sustain that there's no barriers, natural or man-made, to keep pollinators safe. If any other livestock or crop product, likely we'd have very different discussions would arise to save them. Please support this bill and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Representative Jordan, Margaret, Margo Monson. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, committee members and Chairman Hanson. My name is Margaret Monson. I live in St. Paul and I'm an entomologist and a beekeeper. The Minnesota DNR website describes wildlife management areas for quote, wildlife watching opportunities to include upland birds, waterfowl, mammals, and more. I wanna suggest that you consider more to include the many trillions of invertebrates without which we soon will no longer have the abundance of our wildlife and our landscapes or in our aquatic habitats. Why are they so important? Because as Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson has famously said, insects are the little things that run the world. We truly are dependent on the native insect fauna for the health of our landscapes, our waters, and our pollinators that provide so much of our food. So I'm hoping you will consider wildlife management to be seriously concerned about protecting our smallest animal life. In my graduate research study in caddisflies in Minnesota, I worked in several different aquatic habitats, including lakes, rivers, creeks, and in one, a scientific natural area in Northern Minnesota called Iron Springs Bog. There are over 160 scientific and natural areas in Minnesota, and each is unique in its ecological description. And sometimes within just one, there are many habitats. For example, Blue Stem Prairie SNA in Clay County has a wet prairie, a sedge meadow, dry upland, calcareous fen, and one of the largest remnants of tall grass music prairie in the Midwest. Each of these places quite often has unique flora and fauna they are special places that need to be protected from human activities, including insecticide exposure. The neonicotinoids are the class of systemic neurotoxic pesticides used most widely all over the world. 
and the chemicals in this class are used throughout agriculture production in rural Minnesota. And dozens of them are in ingredients that are found in common uh, insecticides on the shelves of every single hardware store and most garden centers throughout Minnesota. There are many studies that have documented the presence of neonicotinoids in aquatic habitats, and when these are found to be in excess of toxicity and regulatory standards, they may bioaccumulate in these aquatic organisms. So now studies have found that these chemicals have negatively impacted populations of some of the invertebrates that are important bioindicators of water quality, such as mayflies, which in some areas are down 50%, and caddisflies. And in addition to being important food for fish, these uh, aquatic organisms are integral to maintaining the health of water bodies. The amount of pesticides that are accumulating in our waters and our soil are also having devastating effect on all our pollinators. And I'm not just talking about honeybees and monarchs here. I'm talking about our native pollinators and native insects. We have over 20 species of bumblebees in Minnesota and the neonics have uh, affected foraging behavior, reproduction, growth, and in addition to the federally protected rusty uh, patch bumblebee, there are about a fourth of the bumblebees in the U.S. right now that are in decline. Pollinator studies also document that neonics are highly toxic to honeybees. Beekeepers have been, effect, uh, been experiencing declines in their colonies for several years now, and it has coincided with the introduction of neonics uh, in the early 2000 in the agricultural systems. So we all know that honeybees are critical to the production of certain crops. We need to remember that the native bees and pollinators are the super glue that hold all of our wild places together. And they all rely on that native pollinators for integrity. I won't repeat what Lori Cox just said, but I also got that call from the DNR yesterday explaining about the percentages of neonics that are found in the deer spleens that have been already examined. And I don't know that she added that of those 61%, uh, they have sent 57 to the Michigan State uh, you know, um, Office to analyze them through mass spectrometry, which will give a different analysis. The ELISA test that the DNR has been using is looking primarily at just clothianidin or I'm sorry, add a metacloprid, but this mass spectrometry analysis will be able to corroborate whether or not some of the other chemicals within the uh, neonicotinoids class are also have been uh, taken up by the spleen. So I hope HF 1210 will ban the neonics and will include, of course, chlorpyrifos pesticides so harmful to human health and will be written to specifically include our state parks, our forests, our aquatic management areas, and those scientific and natural areas, in addition to the wildlife management areas. And thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Jordan. Next up, uh, Pat Rivers. I believe so. Mr. Rivers. Good afternoon, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Pat Rivers. I'm the Deputy Director for the Division of Fish and Wildlife. In 2017, the DNR, uh, working with our cooperators, eliminated the use of insecticides and fungicides on our wildlife management areas. A letter was sent to every cooperator outlining the changes. And since that time, we've also included a, uh, a term and condition on each of the cooperative farming agreement uh, agreements, uh, eliminating or, or prohibiting the use of insecticides and fungicides, including neonicotinoids. Uh, I can stand for any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Representative Jordan, I have uh, Chris Cowan has also asked to testify. Um, so Mr. Cowan. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you. And thank you members for allowing me to speak today. Just a few brief remarks. Um, I just wanna add that the Minnesota Environmental Partnership also submitted a letter of support. It didn't make it into the packets, but I believe members uh, got those letters uh, individually. Um, so if you have a chance, please take a look at that. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the deer study that the DNR just came out with is just, unfortunately, just another uh, uh, story where damage caused by the legal use of neonics is becoming more and more widespread. Uh, two other examples of this would be the uh, use of treated seeds in, in an ethanol plant down in Nebraska, which is causing a lot of damage. And just today, a news item came out about the neonic content in pet collars. Unfortunately, 
killing uh, 1,700 pets across the country and making many owners sick. And this is per the EPA documents as outlined in a USA Today story. Um, but closer to home would be the uh, DNR study uh, with the impact on deer. And two observations on that that at least struck me is first off, how widespread the impact was. It basically goes from one corner of the state to the other. And notable to me is how much the impact took place in areas far from uh, agricultural use where there's corn and soybean fields. Um, it's truly statewide. Uh, the other thing that struck me is that I had a chance to see uh, a couple of the letters that were sent to deer hunters that included some information that didn't seem to make it into the press packets that the DNR put out. And that's the degree of what I'll call the degree of toxicity. Um, in the spleens, uh, the neonic that was discovered in some cases was 6.1 nanograms per gram. And the South Dakota State University study as referenced in the DNR letter um, put a kind of a baseline uh, mark for uh, fawn survival rates being impacted when the rates are 0.33 nanograms per gram. Well, I don't know how many cases it is in with the DNR um, numbers, but uh, it, it sounded plural with the 6.1 figure. That's 18 times the rate that was noted in the South Dakota State University study. So I hope this information has an impact. Um, I hope that what is now policy uh, uh, becomes law. And after all, it's the legislature, I, I'm sorry if I'm saying too much, but, but it's the legislature and the governor who sign in the law that tells the DNR what to do. So um, I hope that you give them the guidance to put this into law. And then also with the chlorpyrifos, um, when the EPA refused to ban chlorpyrifos at the national level, uh, Cortiva, which is the merged corporation of Dow Chemical and DuPont, voluntarily withdrew the, their version of it from the market. They were the largest manufacturer of this product in the world. Um, and, and for the past 21 years, uh, it has not been allowed to be used in the United States for cosmetic purposes because it causes brain damage in children. So these are not the kind of products that the DNR should be allowed to use uh, on state lands where we're talking about wildlife management or, or other uses that are, that are for the enjoyment of, of uh, Minnesotans uh, across the state and also to uh, protect our, our environment so that uh, we're not messing up our food pyramid uh, too much uh, for all of us. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, members, are there any questions? I see Representative Lewick and then Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This uh, this uh, question is for uh, Assistant Commissioner Meyer. Um, I've got a copy of the uh, South Dakota study. I've heard references now to the Minnesota study on neonix versus uh, uh, white-tailed deer. Uh, is the DNR going to make that study? clearly public to us on this committee, since it's clearly in play now as a reference uh, by at least some testifiers, uh, disappointed uh, that uh, when I asked for the study, <laughs> and I, I was really asking for the Minnesota study, not the South Dakota one, uh, but at any rate, maybe uh, Commissioner Meyer could expound on what exactly are we doing and what are the details on the Minnesota study? Thank you. Representative Lewick, uh, Representative Beckland and I were on a briefing uh, that Senator Wef Westrom was on. I believe it was made available to the chairs and the leads, uh, both the House and the Senate committees on agriculture and the environment. There were three of us on that call, uh, Zoom meeting uh, about noon. So uh, I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, learned a lot about the study and I'm sure it's available for you as well. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members for the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources and Representative Hansen's correct. We did offer an opportunity and we can offer another one for people who weren't able to join us this afternoon at noon to go over our preliminary results. We're in the process of completing that study. It's not complete yet until uh, as one of the previous witnesses said, the, the results come back on that mass spec testing 
from Michigan State University. So uh, we talked a little bit about that today, get, get that further analysis completed, and we can complete our study then, which we will share with you all after that next step is completed. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I, look, yeah, thank you. Just a quick follow up. Well, I, I would just please in the future urge uh, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to not get ahead of uh, uh, the study and the information uh, with news releases because you've obviously created a lot of legitimate questions in a lot of people's minds uh, over something that you now admit that you're not even completed, uh, you haven't completed the study. And I, I'm just disappointed uh, to say the least that uh, uh, apparently the, the media writers were quicker than the scientists on this one. And I, I think it does the citizens a disservice uh, to kind of trickle this information out. But uh, anyway, we need to certainly get to the bottom of it. Don't get me wrong. We need to follow the science, but this is not a, a, a well thought out way to, to trickle the science out uh, with news releases. But anyway, appreciate that. Thank you. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I actually want to thank the DNR um, for sharing the information with the public sooner than later. I think, um, you know, just because a study isn't complete doesn't mean that the part that's completed thus far is inaccurate or somehow scientifically not sound. And so I think it is important that the public be aware of this as soon as possible. Um, I was I was glad, uh, Representative Jordan, that you uh, expanded it to include more of our public land. Um, and I, I do think it's important uh, on the the neonic study in deer that uh, they're finding it all over the state. It isn't limited to just one area. And uh, you know, one of the headlines, uh, I guess I will ding on one of the uh, newspapers, but ex said that deer were exposed um, to neonics. And the reality is that it's more than that. It's collecting in the tissue and. Um, for folks who eat game animals, I think that that is concerning and maybe it isn't enough for it to be, uh, you know, to kill a deer, but uh, for folks who hunt pheasant or turkey, grouse, squirrel, uh, you know, name the game species, it's it's problematic and a little, it's, it's concerning. Um, and if it's collecting in deer, I would guess that it's probably collecting in humans too. Um, and so I, I think that that's really important, um, you know, as well as we don't know about uh, its impact on wild rice as well. Uh, so I, I just thought it was important to point that out and also to point out that, you know, we, we passed a bill of this committee spending hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of legacy tax dollars to restore, protect and enhance our habitats and here, um, you know, this unregulated chemical is uh, is poisoning those habitats that we're then turning around and spending hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, to try to protect. So this this bill makes a lot of sense to me, and I'm just really glad that we're having this conversation. Uh, you know, as someone who hunts various species that my family then eats, um, I think it's really important that we have this information. So thank you, Representative Jordan. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry about my dog in the background. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Representative Jordan for, for bringing this bill and for including um, chlorpyrifos. Clearly, these pesticides should not be used on our WMAs. I'd actually like to see the ban go farther. Um, the article that, about the deer study was pretty chilling that deer across the state have um, concentration of neonics. Is, um, we need to pay attention to that. Um, Chlorpyrifos has been recognized as a dangerous pesticide for many years. It was actually banned from residential use in 2001. Um, EPA was set to uh, ban it in uh, 2016, but the uh, previous administration overturned that. And I think it's worth um, reading the quote that the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with in response to that overturning of the ban. Um, saying there is a wealth of science demonstrating the detrimental effects of chlorpyrifos exposure to developing fetuses, infants, children, and pregnant women. The risk to infant and children's health and development is unambiguous. As a, as a doctor myself and an obstetrician, obviously specifically, I, I just find it unconscionable that we're ignoring clear science and putting the health and safety of our children at risk. I, these dangerous pesticides should be banned. Um, we need to find better, safer, and healthier ways to grow our food supply. 
So Representative, thank you very much for elevating this issue. And I hope this conversation continues. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, Representative Becker Finn brought up a couple of things and it actually triggered some questions. And I'm, I'm hoping that Commissioner Meyer can, can uh, spread some, put some light on this. So, um, the idea that this unrelated chemical is being used on public lands, could we just confirm that? I'm wondering if, uh, if Commissioner Meyer could tell us how widespread the use of these chemicals is, these chemicals are, excuse me. Um, that would be really helpful. It sounds like it's happening all over the state on public land in our backyards everywhere. And I just need some clarification. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, um, members, this amendment was just posted uh, over the last 24 hours. So we've been looking into it and so far we haven't found any uses that would pro be included or prohibited by this bill. Uh, Assistant Director Rivers noted that we do not allow neonicotinoid use on WMAs for our cooperative farming agreements. That would be the only use that would be allowed. So the state, as far as we know, uh, on the nicotinoid side is, is uh, one thing. We're, we're fairly confident that those uses aren't being allowed on state lands, at least that we're aware of. And with the added language, uh, we're not aware of any impacts at this moment in time. However, we're looking into that and we'll get back to the committee uh, as this issue progresses. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Heinzman. Representative Hi. Heinzman. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Chair. I had muted myself there for a moment. You know, I'm, I'm really having a hard time with uh, some of the testimony today suggesting that these chemicals are being broadly used on state properties around the state. It sounds like that's not the case. Uh, I don't have a problem with the bill. I think that it's a very important conversation that this committee should be having. Um, but at the same time, um, to imply that uh, the DNR is somehow haphazardly or, or uh, even strategically using this chemical ar around the state, uh, that, that, that needs to be clarified. And I appreciated that from uh, the commissioner. So. Uh, I'm just going to go back to Commissioner Meyer again, if I could, Mr. Chair. So if we aren't currently doing or applying um, these neonicotinoids in state lands, has it been a practice years ago? Is this relatively new that we don't use that? Or did we, you know, what was the previous history of the use of these chemicals and in, in, in properties that DNR is, you know, doing restoration work or what have you? Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, Representative Heinzman, with the addition of the other units of the Outdoor Recreation Act, we would have to go specifically to the divisions, but uh, forestry does not use neonicotinoid class insecticides or insecticides containing chlorophyros. Um, usually, I mean, generally only herbicides are used for the management of state forests, and we're very careful about that. Uh, parks and trails does not do any broadcast spraying of insecticides on parklands. Um, you know, we may have to treat a hornet's nest or a wasp nest, but that certainly wouldn't fall into this category um, and as any homeowner would do. Uh, the one thing that we are looking into is the use of insecticides and fungicides on buildings to prevent structural damage. However, we are, we're pretty confident that these compounds do not contain neonicotinoids. Um, they also don't do, they have less than 100 acres of cooperative farming agreements or agricultural leases as, as they are uh, within the parks that don't allow these compounds as well. Um, you know, I think th the one thing we need to be careful of is, is uh, emerald ash borer treatment possibly, right? We will allow injection of insecticides into specimen ash trees uh, that are there to protect uh, from emerald ash borer, but we haven't done any of that yet. So, um, you know, insecticides and fungicides, as, as Director Rivers talked about, may not be used under cooperative farming agreements under wildlife management areas. And certainly scientific and natural areas would not um, be, we wouldn't be using these types of compounds at all in a scientific and natural area. So um, representative, Mr. Chairman, members, I hope that helps answer some questions there. Mr. Chair. 
Representative Heinzman, and then we got to move on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just want a uh, quick comment. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer, for those clarifications. Um, uh, I also had my staff looking, and, and Mr. Chairman, if I missed it, um, you know, it's an oversight, but we're not, I was not aware of a briefing this morning, or I should say at noon today. Um, it wasn't something that was a, a highlighted issue. Maybe there was information somewhere indicating that that was available for leads, but uh, it wasn't obvious enough that it was on my staff's radar. So that is also another concern as we're talking about this information relative to a deer study. Uh, it would be really nice if, if it that was more readily available previous to uh, the discussion today. Um, and then just a, uh, you know, a, a final comment, I guess, uh, if, if our question for the bill author more specifically. Um, maybe it's covered and we've already discussed it, but just want to confirm that uh, as the commissioner was bringing up that Emerald Ash Borer issue, that this bill wouldn't adversely affect those treatments. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Heinzman, um, for both the question and your offer to work on pesticide management in the future. Um, it's not my intention to impact um, Emerald Ash Borer treatment. It's definitely something that can be worked on with this bill. Mr. Chair, just to confirm. Yeah, uh, Representative Heinzman, I think we had testimony before when we were in the joint Emerald Ash Borer hearing that the, the systemic that was being used, and I don't remember the name, was not a neonicotinoid when we had the joint ag hearing. So um, I, I believe that, but we could have staff check that. I believe that it um, that would not be impacted because there are other alternatives. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It just makes sense that we would absolutely confirm that before this bill would to be uh, moving forward. We need to confirm that, you know, for sure. And it is being laid over. So uh, Representative Backer and then Representative Lippert and then uh, uh, we have a couple other bills uh, we want to make sure we get to. Yeah. So. Uh, thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. I would have to um, echo um, our lead on our side. You know, when there's a briefing like that, we all have election certificate. I think we should all get that information. Um, it allows us to do a better decision for the state because we are working together for the state of Minnesota. We may have disagreements on how we should do that, but everybody needs that information. Um, um, this question is for maybe Director Rivers or uh, Commissioner Myers. Um, can you comment on the safety of eating venom, you know, deer meat from if, if deer was exposed to any of the needle, needle nicks or insecticides that we were talking about? Has there been any studies on, on that? Or maybe the study talked about it that we weren't privileged to. Mr. Chair. Meyer. Uh, Representative Backer, thank you for that question. And actually, it, it was discussed during uh, a, a call yesterday with we had the Department of Health staff on. There, there is no known concern at the testing levels that we currently have uh, for the, the neonicotinoids within deer that people should be worried about. The testing levels that, that we've identified the highest, as we've stated, was 6.1 parts per billion. The way I understand it, current EPA regulations for neonicotinoids on fruit uh, is about 500 parts per billion. So we are factors away, but um, you know we want to make sure people are aware of what what we're sampling. So or what we've tested. That's why we notified the people who participated in that study. Okay. Representative Backer. Well, yeah, a couple of things just so people understand. We th throw a lot out of parts per billion, parts per million. And even parts per trillion now. Um, just to give everybody a reference, parts per billion is like taking an Olympic size swimming pool and put one drop of lemonade or whatever substance in there. That is a parts per million approximately. Um, Representative Meyer, maybe you could do this. So right now, if I heard you correctly when you were talking to um, one of our reps here that DNR does not, the neonicotinoids and the other chemicals addressed in, addressed in this bill is not being used right now from DNR or any other agencies, state agencies. Is that correct? Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Backer, I cannot speak for any other state agencies. I would assume not, but from the DNR's management on our lands, we are not using these types of materials. Okay. One last question for the author then, please. Uh, Representative Backer. 
so um, w when you're putting this together, um, this bill together, where did you come across that? Was there any agencies that came across that you came across with that was using these chemicals? Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Becker, did I hear you ask if other state agencies have been using these chemicals? Is that correct? Um, I can't hear you very well. Is, okay. that, is that your question that you asked yeah, me? You come across any, obviously someone brought this up to you, Representative Jordan. Just was wondering, did you come across agencies or someone informed you that someone was an agency or state government was using these chemicals? Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Representative Backer, I were, when I wrote this bill, I worked with other representatives. I did not find that, but I think it's really, it sets a really great precedent that the leadership of Commissioner Meyer and Commissioner Stroman has been to not use these priorities. And I wanna see that go forward into the future. So that's why I authored this bill, not because of any wrongdoing, but to encourage and continue the leadership that we've seen so far. We're good. Uh, I saw Representative Lippert's hand up, but I don't see it anymore. Representative Lippert. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question has been addressed. Any other questions or comments? Members, I think it's important to know there are nat no naturally occurring neonicotinoids. Imidacloprid is not something that is natural in the environment. Cothalanin is not something natural in the environment. This class of chemicals was is relatively recent, 20 to 25 years since it's been introduced into widespread retail use. So the long-term effects we don't know. We don't know. And so now there have, uh, and we've heard in this committee in previous years, uh, published study after published study after published study on the effect on pollinators, both honeybees and other natives. And now we're starting to see it affect mammals. So I think this is a simple bill that can affect um, our public lands that belong to all of us. And I applaud. Uh, Representative Jordan for her work. Representative Jordan, any closing comments? Oh, uh, we have a closing comment that we heard earlier from Ms. Monson that our pollinators are the super glue that hold our ecosystems together and they deserve our support here in the legislature. Thank you for the consideration. House file 1210 is laid over as amended. Next up uh, is House file 1563, uh, the 2020 DNR policy bill. Vice Chair Wozlowick, uh, would you like to take the gavel or the hockey puck, uh, so to speak, for the for the meeting. I will, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Hanson, would you like to move your bill? I would move House File 1563 be recommended to be re-referred to Ways and Means. Uh, Representative Hanson, I understand you also have an author's amendment. Um, will you move that amendment and then just briefly explain it? Thank you. Uh, I would move the A3 amendment. Uh, members, the A3 amendment is the author's amendment. Uh, including portions uh, that were included in the bill discussions at the end of the year last year. So they are components beyond the DNR policy that were in the DNR policy discussions in conference committee at the end of session uh, at 2020. So I would move the A3 amendment to get the bill in the form I would like. Representative Hansen moves the A3 amendment to get the bill in the form the author wants. All those in favor of adopting the A3 amendment? Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Heinzman. I raised my hand. Uh, yes, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to uh, talk briefly about the amendment and I have some concerns. There's a number of uh, added policy provisions in the amendment that uh, are gonna be, I think, somewhat controversial. And uh, unfortunately, I can't support the amendment. So thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak to that. All those in favor of adopting the amendment? Aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Aye. No. no. The amendment is adopted. Representative Hansen to your bill as amended. I have with me um, Commissioner Meyer with a DNR to walk through the bill. Commissioner Meyer. Madam Chairman, members, thank you for the record. Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. The base bill, uh, as introduced, House File 1563, contained the, the DNR provisions from last session. So DNR is last year's policy bill. As that bill progressed forward, 
Um, obviously, it became a vehicle. There were other amendments placed on by the House, likewise amendments placed on the Senate. When we came back and we were preparing for uh, session 2021, the DNR bill 1563 reflects the DNR's portions of those pieces. The language that Chairman Hansen just amended on or you just amended onto the bill, I believe contains most of the provisions that were included in the bill last year as it moved off of the House floor from the House side. So just a little background there. Um, and it's going to be kind of jumpy because now I'm working off of as introduced and I don't have the amendment in front of me, but I will um, work through the as introduced sections and uh, talk about what was at least I was a no was amended or maybe um, how nonpartisan staff could help with the amendment pieces for me if that works for you, Madam Chair. Yep, with go ahead, that, Commissioner. I will start. Section one of the bill deals with uh, some technical changes to, to VHS or some of the certifiable fish. To, is actually, this is certifiable diseases that continues to uh, evolve just like everything else uh, in the medical world. So we're updating that list. Section two uh, is where we start talking about VHS changes and the language that we have. Basically, what we're doing is updating the language in the bill uh, and in statute dealing with fish health and inspections to expand, you'll see here uh, section five, um, we're, we're changing the definition of VHS susceptible species to clarify that there are aquatic species that are natural hosts for viral hemorrhagic septicema uh, VHS, according to VHS or health, fish health blue book of the book successor. This is a federal document uh, that contains all of the list of the, the fish diseases. And rather than come through and change statute every year, we're going to tie this uh, list to what's in that blue book. Section seven also deals with our testing of VHS moving down. Uh, section eight as well. Uh, section nine, section 10 gets to those pieces as well. What we're trying to do, section 11 is VHS and 12 as well. We're just, you can see, if you look at section 12, for example, we're inserting, taking out all the language that talked about this susceptible list published by the United States Department of Agriculture and just referring that statement in all of these different statutes to this VHS susceptible species list that's contained in the blue book. The other major change in the VHS sections that is in the amendment, we are no longer requiring individual um, minnow trappers or uh, people who are collecting bait to test their waters. Representative Eklund and I have worked on this issue with the legislature in the past. The requirements used to be placed on the individual minnow trapper to test their water body at a certain time of year and a certain temperature. They would pay for that, that we would certify that water disease free and they could go about trapping their bait for sale. We've moved or we are moving to a, a, a zoned process whereby we'll be establishing zones within the state. And that's what the amendment that we just put on does. And the DNR will be testing the lakes or the water in those zones and providing those test results or certifying those waters in those zones disease free so those bait harvesters can sell their bait and move forward. It, it's, it's kind of uh, the DNR taking the, the testing responsibility on rather than the individual producers. And, and uh, most people that we've talked to are very, very happy about that change. Moving on to section 14 on page line 9.7. Uh, this is a technical correction to our permanent school fund reporting. It's, it, the intent was that it's every two years not every six months. So you can see we're striking biannually and inserting biennially. So we have been submitting this report every two years, uh, even though this, this error in statute was there, but we're just clarifying that. And again, we were trying to do that last session as well. Um, section 15 comes about as a, a bill that I believe Representative Sandsteed had that, that strikes the archaic requirement to transport 
a previous law or current law says that a person may not transport a snowmobile unless it's currently registered. Well, what if I want to take my, my snowmobile to the junkyard um, or it's the middle of summertime, does it still need to be registered? Uh, so we've worked with stakeholders and, and Representative Sandstein and others, and we support this language. Uh, the next piece deals, it's just to collect the same transport language under collector snowmobile use. Um, section 17 is some language we worked on clarifying definitions uh, related to all-terrain vehicles. Um, we don't have low pressure or non-pneumatic defined in statute. So, um, and frankly, we this is uh, part of the definition that is uh, no longer needed. So we wanted to strike that. Section 18 uh, strikes the sunset provision for our permit for invasive carp. When we initially tried, uh, sought out this language to allowing us to capture a carp, tag it, and then re-release it and track it, we wanted to make sure that it worked. Uh, so we did this just for a period of a couple of years. This technology and these techniques have, have uh, led us to a lot of new information and a lot of new learning on the movement of invasive carp. And we want to remove this sunset provision. Um, section 19, is archaic language related to golf courses that exists in state park uh, statutes. We no longer operate or maintain golf courses within the state park. Uh, section 20, we're just clarifying striking pageant on asserting special events. Um, it's again, a, a term that we do not, uh, we won't have any spe special state park pageant permits. Uh, they're all special event permits. Uh, section 21, just clarifies that we can by written the process that we use to develop policies and procedures uh, for special use permits in state parks. This is similar to other authorities that we have within statute, uh, but it also provides the fact that we publish that in the state register and people, uh, we also do press releases and things like that on that, on those types of changes. Section 22 clarifies that a motor vehicle owner or its lessee is responsible uh, if that car is within the park. And say, for example, it doesn't have a park sticker and we issue a ticket. We just wanna clarify who is responsible for that. Uh, the next section is just a technical correction from pageant to event. Um, section 24 is clarifying the disposition of our receipts for our cross country ski trail passes. Um, we worked with this language with representative Eklund and. The, the Nordic Ski Association to make sure that the dollars coming in and going out are going in and out at the right times. Section 25, uh, again, is that clarification of, of special use permit fees and how that is done. Um, these are for state trails and state water access sites. And then the clarification on top of page 14, subdivision two, talks about where those fees are deposited. Section 26 is just clarifying steps or section numbers. Section 27 is language that we've talked about um, regarding conditions about propagating and issuing permits to breed and sell snakes, lizards, and salamanders. Um, making sure that they're, um, we're, we're, we're talking about not like boa constrictors here, we're talking about um, state, I don't want to say native populations, but state populations of snakes, lizards, and salamanders. Uh, section 28 is just straightening out this. If you look at the way it's written, the third convic conviction that occurs within one year under a mineral, mineral dealer's license, we want to make the convictions to be a second conviction that occurs within three years as all of our other permits and the, uh, the way the the permit processes are established, follow in game and fish law. Section 29 is uh, some conforming language that we're working. Uh, I believe this was, um, might have been a, a representative Swadiski issue we were working on, uh, thermal imaging equipment allowing for the use. This is one other piece that it would provide for. It's actually, this piece provides for the penalty um, for the language that we approved previously. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. This is um, a lot of different pieces we pulled together in this bill. So this would establish penalties for people who are illegally using 
night vision or thermal imaging equipment that we previously have issued or allowed their use of the use of this equipment in law. Section 30 uh, clearly identifies that wild animals taken and tagged on the res Red Lake Reservation lands um, are not fish and wildlife under the state game and fish law since it is a, uh, a separate nation within the state of Minnesota. They do have the authority to have their own game and fish quotas. It's clarifying that this would also just apply to the contiguous reservation boundaries, um, not any isolated boundaries or reservation lands that may not be uh, posted. Section 31 is language that this committee has already passed dealing with uh, importing any cervid carcasses. Um, current law you can see on 15.29 just replies to hunter harvested. And it, it's very important that we make sure that we're uh, prohibiting the introduction or bringing in of any cervid carcasses captured or taken by any means outside of the state. Then we get into section 32, um, which is a technical clarification for muzzle loaders dealing with some new technology. I believe there's one other piece in the amendment that talks about a battery that also fits in with this language. Um, and then section 33, is clarification use that it does not, um, a, a, using a crossbow during a, the, the firearm season applies to muzzle loaders as well. So a crossbow would not be allowed by a licensed muzzle loader hunter during the muzzle loader firearm season. Mr. Chairman, oh, I'm sorry, keep going here. Um, section 34 relates to that light visioning equipment. This is the piece I was referring to, you'll see we're allowing this night vision enhanced infrared illuminator. Uh, this is another piece of the technology, the equipment that, that is needed for this, this use. Most of this uh, use applies to taking coyotes uh, and other predators at night. Um, section 35, again, is another piece related to the Red Lake section I just talked about. Section 36 clarifying the VHS susceptible list that we talked about with the blue book. Section 37 is another technical correction conforming to that piece. Um, 38, uh, you'll see the major change here is 18.31. A person may not use um, more than two nets, so we're just saying they can only use one net. So uh, kind of, um, simplifying the statutes and then just striking nets plural and inserting net. Um, section 39 is removing uh, this date to uh, report fisheries management plan. We have updated that. So we wanna make sure that it's within the current 10 year fisheries management plan for Minnesota waters of Lake Superior and not the outdated report date in 2006. Section 40 um, allows us, these two pieces um, are actually traveling separately in a bill as well, but allow us a process to update the, the Mississippi River critical corridor area plans uh, in an expedited fashion. These are, we, the local units of government review and approve their plans and we have to review them, approve them and they are placed into rule what we're doing here is, is streamlining that approval process for the state of Minnesota to um, authorize, or basically we're just codifying another local unit of government's decisions. So that language would allow us to do that. Um, then we get into some pieces of the lands bill that were discussed last year. Um, and you can see what this would provide for. Um, Previous statute has a uh, language that requires the DNR to exchange lands. These are school trust fund lands that currently have wild rice leases on them. Uh, we're working through that, but this language will clarify that uh, the leases must pay all of the costs associated with each exchange transaction, including valuations, legal fees, survey expenses, title work, et cetera. Um, since these, these leases um, are basically to 
conform with the landowners who want to no longer lease the land, but want to acquire it. Uh, we're just asking them to pay all the costs of those transactions. Madam Chair, the rest of the bill, there's several repealers that are listed. You can see those um, 85.0505 subdivision three, 850507 and 850054 subdivision 19. And those are listed here on the, the next page. One dealing with, uh, two dealing with Fort Ridgely and the other, or actually all three of them deal with Fort Ridgely, Madam Chair, I apologize. That is the bill as introduced. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Um, Chair Hanson, did you want to have staff go through the amendment? Did you want to describe the amendment? And what, what would you like to do next? Why don't we have Ms. Taylor go through it? Okay. Ms. Taylor. Madam Chair, members, I'm going to go through the A3 amendment. Uh, Mr. Maher did mention section 14 already, and it's uh, also tied to section 39 of the amendment. And these are um, VHS related provisions that the DNR had worked out. Uh, section 15 and 16 of the amendment. These are from House File 219 that we heard earlier this session regarding farm survey. Day. Um, uh, section 15 is the one allowing hunters to harvest uh, escaped farm survey. Day and the other section, section 16 of the ID requirements. And then section 29, Mr. Meyer had mentioned also, this is a related provision to the muzzleloader changes to allow the, um, the newer muzzleloaders. And this was just a um, section that was missed, I believe, in the original. As introduced bill, uh, section 30 is um, the bill we just heard as introduced uh, regarding neonics and the WMAs. And then lines 3.16 and 3.17 modify the section Mr. Meyer mentioned on the snake, lizard, and salamander permits. This would narrow it to um, native species and also clarify that um, they would not be allowed to be possessed if they um, were subject to any restrictions under the threatened or endangered species laws. And then the last section, section 43, is from House File 990 on the SWCD supervisor compensation that we heard earlier as well. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Um, I do have a couple testifiers, if you can be brief. Um, Mr. Tim Spreck, you're up first. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Am I being heard? Yep. Thank you. Um, very briefly, I'm going to, uh, so, I'm sorry, Tim Spreck representing the interests of the Minnesota Deer Farmers this afternoon. Members, I'm going to make some brief comments directed to the A3 Amendment Section 15 and 16. Probably no shock to anyone that we are very concerned and do oppose these sections. In the interest of time, um, this committee has heard my comments and the position of the clients on this issue in previous uh, bill airings of House Bill 219. So I'm just going to uh, suggest that members look at the letter that we've submitted with regard to these items on this amendment. And uh, and thank you for my for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Spreck. Next up, we have Tony Quillis. If you can identify yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Tony Quillis and I'm representing the Minnesota Elk Breeders Association. Um, and listening to Mr. Meyer's testimony too, it remind me of the time when Representative Hansen years ago took the time to teach me how to say viral hemorrhagic septicemia um, years ago. But it, uh, I wanna thank him again for teaching me how to do that. But Madam Chair I just and members, I just wanted to bring up um, and remind members, same thing as Mr. Sprack, that House File 219 authored by Representative Eklund when we had heard it earlier. I just wanted to remind members that the Board of Animal Health is currently undergoing a process to update their rules in regards to farm survey. Day. And in those rules, it deals with escape farm survey Day that are harvested or found dead and they must be tested for CWD. But in terms of being specific to elk, I just wanted to remind members that that language uh, on the A3 amendment from 2.4 to 2.8 in terms of elk, 
The only place that you can legally, in a lawful manner, kill elk in the state of Minnesota are up in Roseau Kitson County in between August 22nd and December 13th. So anybody who shot an elk outside of those two counties wouldn't be taking it in a lawful manner. And then also, Madam Chair, I think the key there is kill and possess. If we're unfortunately, there's escapes don't happen a lot for elk and we want the elk back, they're very popular to us are very popular, very financially profit, popular to us. Our animals cost somewhere between hundreds and thousands of dollars. We want to find out if it's testing positive for CWRD or not, and what type of test it's going to be, if it's going to be the IHC test or the ELISA test. But I can't do that if the hunter killed it and possesses it. If he's got the body in the back of his truck and he's going down a county road, I can't test it. I've got no determination of how to test it and what type of test it's gonna be. So thank you, Madam Chair, for expressing my concerns. I just, I just wanted to point that out to, to the committee um, and I don't wanna get Representative Bo mad because I know he's next on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Quillis. Um, we'll take a couple of member questions. We do have another bill that we have to get to. So I saw Representative Becker Finn's hand up first. Yep. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just wanted to uh, point out that if the elk season is that narrow, then there really isn't anything for the elk breeders to be worried about um, as far as what uh, this bill does. So, and I understand that we don't want to come in and amend the bill too, if the elk season were to expand further in the future, but I think right now there's not too much for you to worry about. I see Representative Lewick has a question or a comment. Representative Lewick? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a just a quick comment. Uh, I still want to raise uh, concerns that this deals with Chapter 35, which is uh, under the auspices of the uh, Department of Agriculture. And so uh, uh, I just want to go on a record. I can't support this bill as amended uh, unless the author is going to send it directly to the Agriculture Committee before we go any further. So uh, could the author indicate is, is, I believe, is this going out of the Committee to Ways and Means? Yes, that's, it's going to Ways and Means, Representative Luke. Oh, okay, well, I, and again, I, and, and I don't want to uh, uh, in any way uh, cut short the hard work of the chair uh, or the DNR on getting all this stuff put together because we've been working on some of this stuff for three or four years. But again, because of that one small issue, I, I can't support this going forward, but thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. Representative Hansen, if you want to have some closing remarks. Uh, appreciate the discussion. Uh, there will be additional bills coming. I think uh, Representative Lewick, you may want to look at uh, Mr. Quillis, may want to look at uh, Representative Eklund's bill that was introduced yesterday. Um, and uh, with that, I would encourage uh, support for House File 1563 and renew my motion that it be recommended to be re referred to Ways and Means. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 1563 as amended be recommended to be re referred to Ways and Means. The clerk will take the roll on the motion. Hansen, Rick. Aye. Hansen, aye. Waslowick, Amy. Waslowick, aye. Waslowick, aye. Heinzeman, Josh. No. Heinzeman, no. Acom, Patty. Acom, aye. Acom, aye. Ackland, Susan. Ackland, no. Ackland, no. Backer, Jeff. Backer, no. Becker, no. Becker, Finn, Jamie. Aye. Becker, Finn, aye. Eklund, Rob. Aye. Eklund, aye. Fisher, Peter. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Green, Steve. No. Green, no. I go, Spencer. I go, Spencer. Uh, Jordan, Sydney. Jordan, aye. Jordan, aye. Keeler, Heather. Keeler, aye. Healer I Lee Fu. Lee Fu. Uh, Lippert Todd. Lippert I. Lippert I. Lewick Dale. Lewick no. Lewick no. Morrison Kelly. Morrison I. Morrison I. Uh, Nelson Nathan. No. Nelson no. Uh, Tice Tama. Tice no. Tice no. Um, and then we're going to go back for, uh, I go Spencer. I don't know. I go no. 
and then Li Fu. That is 10 eyes and eight nose. All right, the motion prevails and the bill is on its way to Ways and Means. I will turn the gavel back over to Chair Hansen for the last bill. Thank you, Vice Chair Wazlawik. I will, uh, <clears throat> next we have uh, 1621. I represent a bow, Minnesota River dredge spoil. We've got uh, 10 minutes, uh, represent a bow. So I will move the House File 1621 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Represent a bow to your bill. Very good. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the community, thank you so much for hearing House File 1621. As a quick introduction, the seminary fen is a rare calcareous fen, and right through the middle of it runs Assumption Creek, which is one of only a few cold running trout streams in the metro that still survives. So this area is very special, a very special place, and we're very proud of it. To the bill, House File 1621 allows funds granted to the Lower Minnesota River Watershed District from Bowser to fill a gap for work done on the seminary fan in Chanhassen. Unfortunately, there was a miscommunication several years ago when both Bowser and the LMRWD had staff changes and a grant fell through the cracks and was lost. Subsequently, the LMRWD had to pay the city of Chanhassen for its portion of the project, leaving a gap in the Lower Minnesota River Watershed District accounting. This bill will allow the LMRWD to transfer funds to fill that gap. Uh, Ms. Linda Loomis, who's the executive director of the Lower Minnesota River Watershed District, is here to answer any questions you may have. Ms. Loomis, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think that uh, Representative Bowes signed could, up. The... If you could just state your name and who you're with for the record. Oh, yes. I am Linda Loomis, and I am the administrator for the Lower Minnesota River Watershed District. And uh, Representative Bo did a pretty good job there of laying out uh, the situation that occurred. It, it was a difficult project. We had a lot of delays due to uh, changes in staff at the city of Chaska where the project was uh, done and uh, at the watershed district and weather got in the way. And between that and uh, everything else, we did not get the reporting done in time to uh, get the grant funds that we had intended to pay for the project with. And um, now we have a hole in our budget and we're looking to direct some of the money we have for dredging. Um, and the reason we have money remaining from the uh, funds we got for dredge management is that we had a capital project that we did there and we got a very favorable bid and uh, had some money remaining, and now we'd like to apply it to this project instead. And if any, there one has questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Members, any questions? Members, I support the bill. It uh, it was a mess, uh, and you're uh, resolving with existing funds, reappropriating it, and I think it needs to get done. So I'd encourage support. We are going to lay this bill over. Representative Bo, any closing remarks? No, not really. I just appreciate once again the uh, the opportunity to bring this forward. This is a, a special project. We want to make sure that it gets done and, and done right. And uh, so I appreciate the opportunity. And so I would move that House File 1621 be laid over for possible inclusion. The bill is laid over. Thank you, members. Um, Mr. Strohmeyer, could you walk us through the next uh, couple days with process? Yes, Mr. Chair, we're um, uh, shortly after this meeting, we'll be posting the uh, delete all amendment that includes some clean water fund appropriations uh, as indicated on the posting. Uh, we'll also be hearing the lands bill. So if members um, have any land sales or exchanges that need approval by the legislature, please let me know. I think we would like to do one big amendment that tries to encompass all of uh, members' individual bills. Um, so I'll be working with uh, Ms. Zipko on that, trying to communicate so we can get all of the members' stuff in that we know of that it's fine with the DNR. Uh, we will be uh, meeting on Friday morning. Uh, we'll be hearing a bill uh, by Representative Eklund and some others. Uh, next Tuesday, we'll, we'll be posting um, uh, shortly later today. Um, members have any questions? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
So to members to clarify, we will be putting a delete all amendment up uh, that is a clean water fund appropriations. Uh, that will be available for amendments. Uh, amendments would have to be submitted on Wednesday for Thursday uh, as our usual time allows. And then we would be, be our intent to move the clean water fund appropriations out of this committee on Thursday to uh, 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 Chair Lilly's committee. Um, so I'd encourage you shortly after the meeting to read through that. We will also be providing uh, the opportunity for the agencies to uh, testify on their uh, clean water fund recommendations that were from the clean, clean Water Council and the governor's recommendations. Should note that there will be some uh, differences between the uh, recommendations and the delete all. And I would encourage you to look at those uh, appropriations and policy language. Um, we have about a week left after this week uh, to be moving through. I know that we are um, receiving a lot of requests for bills to be heard. We will not be able to hear all policy bills. Um, and it's important that we uh, have bills that can pass uh, off the floor of the house. And so um, we will be trying to schedule what we can uh, and then we'll be moving into more of the fiscal bills. Um, I don't know, Mr. Strohmeyer, if we have any other bills that are going to other committees that we'll be considering, but uh, we're trying to get those in as well. Yeah, Mr. Any Chair, we're, we're looking at, we're prioritizing bills that that uh, we're, the chair is interested in hearing with other stops and we're just reviewing that and then also taking a look at uh, corresponding with what the um, Senate is doing as well. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, we are adjourned.